Good morning, church. I want to share a scripture with you. Matthew chapter 6, beginning on verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let's pray together. Oh, Father, as we come into your word and we look at prayer, all of us can mature in our prayer life. All of us can grow in our prayer life. All of us have improvement that needs to be made. But first, Father, we want to thank you for the very idea of prayer was your idea that we, a created being, can speak to our Creator. That we have the right to speak to the Creator of all things. And we thank you, God, that you have told us that you are listening to us. And that you even store up our prayers. And then that there is not one prayer that we have uttered before you that you have not heard. And that you know. So thank you God that you are listening to us. Now in our weakness we know we don't pray as we ought to. We don't pray correctly. And we desire to mature in this. We desire to know how to pray. How to speak to you. How to come before you? What should our posture be as we come before the great high king? We thank you that we can call you father, but we balance that with the fact that you are holy and that we should come with reverence. Teach us, God. Please teach us how to be a person of healthy and mature prayer. Our desire is to pray accurately. A prayer that touches your heart. A prayer that is pleasing to you. Teach us, Father. Train us through your word. This is our, this is our heart. That we might pray healthy, Mature prayers. Lastly, Father, we thank you that you did give us instruction on how to pray. Would you guide us now? Would you unblock our ears so that we can hear what the Spirit is saying? Open our eyes so that we can see what the text says. Uh, grant us understanding so that we can comprehend and apply these truths to our lives. And Father, lastly, if there is anything in our life that is offensive to you, that is corrupt within us, would you, would you forgive us? 
For we want nothing to hinder our prayer. Nothing to hinder us from receiving from you. Forgive us, Father, that we might understand your word and stand right before you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. And wherever you are, you can agree by saying, Amen and Amen. I do welcome you to another time together in the Holy Word of the Lord. It is, again, my honor and my privilege to open the text of Scripture with you. We are in, right in the middle of a very short series here in the church. It's simply entitled the Maturity Series, Maturing as Christians. It is good that we are those that follow Christ and call ourselves Christians, but often we can we can find that we have either plateaued where we feel like there is nothing new for us to, to grow in. Maybe there are nuances that we don't understand and small passages of scripture we want to investigate, but we often forget that there is an ongoing maturity to walking as Christ-like people in a very fallen world. All of us have maturing to do. There will never be a day when you reach full maturity here on this side of heaven. So what we've been called to is simply three areas that God has pointed out in our lives that he desires our maturity in. The first was simply remaining faithful. We are in a day and age when we are prone to wander, to drift away from the God we love. The problem with remaining faithful is we often don't recognize that we have drifted away from our Messiah. This is part of the issue, is it is to call to mind that we have lost our first love, that we have become lukewarm, that we are not remaining faithful in the things that we should have implemented in our lives, such as spending time in the Word of God, being people of prayer, having an active life of worship before our God, being part of the community of Christians in your local area. These are things that can become optional in our Christian life. It becomes optional if we spend time in the Word, optional to spend time in prayer. We go to the Lord in prayer, especially when we're upset, especially when we need something, but we have lost the perpetual prayer, the prayer that is here throughout the day-to-day -day life. It doesn't need to be rote, and it doesn't need to be empty because it's consistent. We were called to remain faithful. In the reading of the word, it's become optional in our life. Maybe at one time we were more apt to spend time in the Word of God. However, less time is available. So it seems. Priorities are readjusted so that the Word of God takes a smaller section of time or a backseat. Or in some cases, we abandon time in the Word of God altogether. This is a place where we must remain faithful. So this was the first thing that the Lord called us to in maturing. Today we find ourselves building maturity in our prayer life. We have possibly fallen into a time of either our prayer is non-existent or our prayer has become simply circumstantial. Meaning, whatever we need, that's what we pray for. The I want list of our prayer life. A prayer life that consists of whatever is the trouble, that's the thing that we pray into. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying for the things that are on our heart. However, we have lost a sense of maturity, or maybe we never even knew that there is more to a prayer life than simply coming before God with your personal request that you so desire and treating this as a moment of request and answer. 
God, this is my concern. We wait for his response. God, this is the other thing I want, waiting for him to provide it. This is, can naturally become a, a source of rhythm in our prayer, that we simply are asking God for something, and that is normally whatever it is that we want. It doesn't mean that we don't pray for others. It doesn't mean that we don't pray for things that we think God would want. However, building a mature prayer life involves praying for things that we might not think that we need to be praying for. Things like for the kingdom of God to come. We might not even know what that means, even though we have been taught to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. But have we integrated that into our daily prayer life? Have we, have we any idea the aspects of prayer that should be integrated, should be part of our daily prayer life? This is the time that God has set apart for us to build maturity in our prayer life so that our prayers become more accurate to how God taught us to pray. And that's the beauty is that God has taught us to pray. Twice, actually. Not just in the Old Testament where we can see outlines of prayers from prophets that have come before us, but while Jesus was here, he taught twice on prayer. Once to a very large group of people, he told them how to pray. Once directly to his disciples, where they specifically asked, teach us to pray. So that's where we want to go, is to our instructor and see what outline our Messiah gave us for prayer. And then let's see if we are integrating any of these, these pillars of our prayer life, and if they're involved at all. If we, if we see these attributes of prayer actually happening. And if not, let's see if we can't apply them. There are seven things that Jesus teaches us on the Sermon on the Mount about prayer. Let's go through the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. And he begins not on what we would call the Lord's Prayer, but he begins prior to our Father who art in heaven up in verse 5. So if you have your Bible, we can look at Matthew chapter 6. But Jesus begins speaking on prayer up in verse 5. The first thing he says is this. When you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners. And they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward but when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So the first, the first item that the Lord teaches us about prayer is, number one, the privacy of prayer. The privacy of prayer. It doesn't mean that we don't pray corporately in the halls of the church when we all gather together and we all come before our king in prayer. This is good. Corporate prayer is good. But when he says, don't be like the hypocrites, he's referring to a group of people that were acting and trying to look religious, but there was nothing coming out of their heart. This was the, the pharisaical leadership. They were... They were looking the part, but there was nothing pouring out of their heart. So there were public prayers simply to grandstand themselves and make themselves seem holier than everyone around them. This is why the first thing we want to learn about the privacy of prayer is that prayer is lonely. It's a lonely thing to do. 
It doesn't mean we can't pray with our spouse. It doesn't mean we can't pray with our family. It doesn't mean we can't pray in the halls of the church. But the primary time of prayer is between you and God that we see when he said, close the door and pray in secret. What kind of secret prayer life do you have with God? Jesus had a secret prayer life, even though his ministry was so incredibly public. Wherever Jesus went, there were crowds that followed him. But I want to show you that in Matthew chapter 14, verse 23, it says that after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. Even our Messiah walked away from the crowds and got alone to talk to his father. So the question is, what kind of prayer life do you have when you're alone? Do you have a prayer life at all when you're alone? Now, some fundamentals of this is often we can pray in our mind, which is fine, where there are no words coming out and we begin to pray in our mind and in our spirit, and that's fine, but I would encourage you to speak aloud to God. It is, it is healthy for us to, to speak aloud to God. It helps us organize our thoughts as well. So we're not constantly distracted by everything around us, which what tends to happen when we get inside our mind is our mind is prone to wander naturally. Speaking aloud to God, it will be very awkward at first when you're speaking by yourself seemingly into the air, but it's a good practice to build a maturity in your prayer life. You don't need to constantly have and try to build some sort of atmosphere, some sort of moving music around you. There's nothing wrong with setting an atmosphere, but remember, God is saying he wants to hear from you, and he wants to be able to speak to you. So get quiet, get in secret, and talk to God. Talk to God about what's on your heart. That is number one. Let's go to number two. We find the second principle that Jesus gives us in prayer in verse seven and eight of Matthew chapter six. He goes on and says, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So the second thing is authentic, not rote. Authentic, not rote. Don't offer up religious sounding statements. We, we have all heard people pray where it sounds like they're simply reciting a religious statement, as if they don't even know the words that are coming out of their mouth. It's just a, a common religious practice. And I think it's important that we, we heed what Jesus is saying because it's still happening today, but it was happening 2,000 years ago where people were offering up empty phrases, just praying either uh, ceremonial prayers, meaning prayers that they already had written that they had memorized. We have those today. We even have this prayer, the Lord's Prayer, as a prayer that we can pray in the halls of the church. But we don't want to offer up something empty where we're mindlessly reciting something just because we've always done it. We need to know what we're saying and saying it on purpose. Did you know that he actually says in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 2, Do not be rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. We don't need to come before God in some rambling, constant, conversational pattern where we're just rambling along, either offering up empty phrases where we're just reciting prayers from memory, or we don't want to get to the point where we are merely conversational with God. 
or just rambling off what's ever coming to our mind. No, let your words be few. Don't empty these, these phrases just as if he is not a holy God. Come before him and speak to him on purpose with clarity and reverence not with just empty phrases. Can we mature in offering to God not just a rambling of whatever is on the top of our mind, but also not offering to God some religious cycle whereby it has just become rote? Now, that brings up the question, what about prayers that we know that, for example, the Lord's Prayer, where it's something that we have prayed over and over and over again. Can you pray the same prayer over and over and over again? What if you're praying for something that you've been asking the Lord for for a long time? Can you come back and say the same thing that you said before? Absolutely, even Jesus did that. In Matthew 26, verse 44, it says that Jesus went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Jesus went before his father and prayed, then he came back to his disciples, left the disciples, went back, prayed the exact same thing again, left, went back to his disciples, and the third time, the same prayer. But I guarantee you, it wasn't rote, and it wasn't uh, mundane. It was something that he was passionate about. And the request came three times over. Can you pray for someone that you love to be healed more than once? Absolutely. Can you pray for your children who don't walk with the Lord more than once? Absolutely. But we don't want it to become mundane. We don't want it to become a rote, repetitious, empty nothing. And after some empty phrase, these are burdens that are on our heart that we can bring before God authentically, and with passion each time that we pray. So can you pray the same thing? Absolutely. But can you get into a rut where you're merely rehearsing the prayer by reciting the memorized statements in your mind? I can tell you that I remember going into the hospital and being asked by this particular person that was a member of this church um, to come in and he had moments left here on this earth before he went to be with his king. And I remember he said, pray with me, Reverend. And in those moments of these final moments, what do you say? What do you pray? And he was holding my hand and I began to take a deep breath and get ready to pray. And then he prayed what we would know as the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. In what little strength he had, this was the prayer that left his lips. And then when he finished, he began again, Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. I just simply held his hand and began to join him by praying a prayer that he has prayed his whole life. I guarantee you that was not rote, but he meant every phrase of that prayer. He knew he had moments before he stood before a holy God, and this was the prayer that was on his heart to pray. So can you pray a prayer that has been pre-written down and still have it be authentic? Absolutely. Can you pray a prayer that's brand new off your lips, but it means nothing to you and you just go through a religious cycle? Yes. This simply means don't offer up an empty phrase. Think about what you want to say to God and then speak to him. Know that he is listening. Speak on purpose. Now we get to what we would actually know as the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. And I want to point out that there is an incredible juxtaposition in the Lord's Prayer. You'll see a balancing act in each line that we're about to go over. For example, it begins with, Our Father, 
hallowed is your name. He, he is approachable, yet he is holy. Let's watch this beautiful balance that Jesus set up teaching us how we are to pray. And remember, this is being taught to a crowd of people on the Sermon on the Mount. But if you go to Luke chapter 11, you'll see that it was actually one of the disciples that said when they saw Jesus praying in a certain place, when he finished, one of the disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say this. So both on the Sermon on the Mount and then later on when it was just his disciples and they asked, teach us to pray. He said, follow this outline. When you pray, say these things. It begins on verse 9 of Matthew 6. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Now, we've looked at the first two aspects of prayer, the first one being the privacy of prayer, the second one, authentic and not rote. The third is here, which is relational with reverence. Again, relational with reverence. Notice that the first thing that we do is not only is it a private thing, not only is it to be authentic, but it is the fact that the first thing he says is that we can call him Father. However, he is to be holy. The idea of relational we find in Romans 8, 14 and 15. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. We have been adopted into the kingdom of God. We could not earn it on our own. We needed him to adopt us. And so we have the right to call him our Father. So yes, when you pray, you're praying to your Father. He gave us that beautiful connection of relationship. But it's balanced with reverence. Because he doesn't just say, you can say, Our Father, how are you today? And begin this flippant conversation with God. He says, Our Father, who is in heaven, and the beginning juxtaposition is Hallowed be your name. You are a holy God. You are a perfect God. You deserve my respect. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28 says, We should offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. So can you find that sweet place in your prayer life where you have the right to come before your Father, yet you come before your Father with reverence and awe? This will remedy the flippancy of what we heard before. Don't come with empty phrases. If you understand that you're coming before the king, even though that king is your father, you still must come with reverence and awe. Can we find that, that sweet place in prayer where God is, yes, relational, but yes, deserving of all reverence in your prayer life? Can you come before your Father on your knees? I'm welcome, but I'm humbled. Can you find that place? This is maturity in your prayer life. The next thing he tells us about prayer, Matthew 6, verse 10, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The fourth piece of this prayer is his kingship, our submission. His kingship, our submission. Your kingdom come 
Remember, what we're saying is that he is the king, but he is the king of kings. He is the highest king, and it's his dominion, his way of doing things. He is the king. He makes the rules. Do we recognize that he is the king of kings? We're not coming before God to tell him what he should do. We're coming before him, and if we acknowledge him as king, then that means that we must recognize that we are not kings. He is. So the first thing we need to learn is, is God, in your mind, your king? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15 says, He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the king of kings and the Lord of of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, who no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Psalm 103 verse 19 says, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. So, The first piece of recognizing this idea that we pray his kingdom come is the idea that he is the king. His way goes. And if we recognize that God is the king, then we have to recognize that you and I are not the king. So you're saying your way of doing things, God, not my way of doing things. That immediately uh, will call to mind how you and I pray because we tend to come before God with our requests. But when you pray your kingdom, your way of thinking, God, I want to come. Your will be done. Remember how Isaiah 55 verse 8 and 9 says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways My ways, declares the Lord. For as as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So what we need to recognize is what we are praying when we say your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, here as it is in heaven. We know that in heaven his will is done. But in your personal life, have you said, I desire God's direction for my life over my own direction for my life? I have an idea of what my life should look like and sound like and feel like. However, I welcome his dominion in my personal life. If he wants to change my course, he is the king. His kingdom come. His will be done. And then we learn to pray like Jesus did in Luke 22. 42, where he said, not my will, but you know the rest. Yours be done. When we learn that this is something that the Messiah himself taught us when he was here, he said, you can call me father, but I am holy. And when you ask for my kingdom to come, you're asking for my will to be done. Do you pray that way? Is this part of your active prayer life? God, I desire your will over my will. How you want to do things over how I think they should be done. He's not finished with us yet. He continues to teach us how to pray in verse 11. Matthew 6, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Number five in our seven steps of a healthy prayer life, number five is desire versus require. Again, desire versus require. The first two lines of verse 11 is our typical tone for our prayer life. Give us, give us, grant us, give us. 
we tend to come before God with demands. Give us this, Lord, and give us that. Success, wealth, health, give us these things. This has become the, the prayer life of the saints. But did you know that this has always been the prayer life of everybody on the planet? Even if they're not children of God, everybody prays the I want prayers. Give us this, God. If you are all powerful, then grant us what we want. But notice what he actually said. Give us this day our daily bread. Remember, we said that this prayer is filled with juxtapositions. Give us, the other side is only what we need. Did you know that Jesus actually uh, taught a parable once where he talked about someone who had been given uh, just an abundant harvest. There was a harvest that they had come in from their crops that was so large, but he shows how he dealt with having this incredible harvest come in. And I, I want to show you how he explains what happened with this man. It's found in Luke chapter 12, verse 19. Jesus said, I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for years. So relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Simply meaning this person had been, they had received a windfall of harvest. And what he actually says before this is, I will just build more barns to store all my wealth. I will just have larger bank accounts so that I can store up my wealth for myself so that I can eat and drink and be merry. And what God is saying is, look, if we're just storing up wealth so that we can store up wealth, it's not that we're trying to pass it down to the next generation and be good stewards, creating shade for our children. That is wise. It is wise that you save and that you are are intellectual about what God has entrusted you with and faithful to do so. But this person received a windfall and was not rich towards God. Just received it so that he could have his own personal pleasure. And it says that in the last days, people will become thinkers like this. How much can we gain so that we ourselves can be safe? We ourselves can have what we want so that we can eat and drink and be merry and forget about those that are less fortunate. What we want to recognize is the prayer that we're being taught is not just give us, give us, give us. But can you imagine if we prayed, give us only daily bread. Give us, Father, what we need, not just what we want. Did you know that in Proverbs chapter 30, there is a prayer that none of us ever pray? It is the most challenging, mature way to pray that none of us ever do. It's in Proverbs chapter 30, and it's in verse 8. And he says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. What of any of us prays, Father, I don't pray for riches. I don't pray for this bountiful harvest to come. Look, if the Lord blesses you that way, then he requires of you to be a good steward with it. But can you imagine if we had the maturity to pray, Father, I ask for only what is necessary, only what I require and nothing more. That is a mature prayer life. 
Father, I pray that you would only give me what I require so that I don't, I don't forget you, so that I don't live just to eat and drink and be merry, but I have what I need. Remember the manna from heaven was not to be stored up in barns. It came new every morning. Again, it does not mean that God has not told us that we should be those that are good stewards with what we're entrusted with and that we should save and we should make sure that we are wise about what we've been entrusted with. However, if we are just trying to build up our barns to be so plentiful that it has become unhealthy and it is only for our own selfish purposes, then we check ourselves when we pray. And we pray, Father, would you teach me how to manage what you've entrusted to me? Am I rich towards you, God? Am I a wise manager? That takes great maturity. Now we come to verse 12, which none of us like. So far, all of the new pieces of information about uh, the five things we've covered thus far about our prayer life needs to be more private, our prayer life needs to not be empty, it doesn't, shouldn't be full with just repetitious prayer. We have gone over the idea of praying for only what uh, we require and not just an I want list. We've, we've covered the fact that he is king, we've covered the fact that When we come before him, we should come with reverence. These are basic pillars that we can all agree upon and we can even, though they're hard and will cause some maturing, it is the the 12th verse that makes us all stumble when we're reading the Lord's Prayer. It is the sixth piece of what he taught us to pray for that causes all of us to pause and all of us to get to a place where we feel that this, this might be the most challenging. Because in verse 12, what Jesus taught us to pray was to forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us. We love that prayer. And it's good that we pray that perpetually. Forgive us, Father, create in me a clean heart, renew in me a right spirit. This is a healthy and daily way that you and I should pray. You do not need to go through another person to receive forgiveness from God. You go directly to God and you can tell him, Father, this is the sin that I know I have thought or done. Father, would you forgive me my debts? All we, like sheep, have gone astray. None of us can say we are sinless. All of us need to ask the Father for forgiveness, which should be part of your daily prayer life. However, we must forgive others for how they have sinned against us. And we don't like that these two ideas of our forgiveness and our willing to forgive are conditional on each other. Did you know that this was so difficult for the crowd to comprehend? The gasp from the crowd hearing that they must forgive those that have sinned against them so that they themselves can be forgiven was so Obvious that this is the only part of the Lord's Prayer, this is the only section that he gives clarification on. There is no clarification on his holiness, no clarification on his kingdom, no clarification on his provision. There's only clarification about this small section of the prayer. If you follow down, In Matthew chapter 6, notice down in verse 14 and 15. This is after the prayer is over. He gives a clarification on just this section. 
Notice verse 14, 15. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. A conditional statement in our prayer life, which means as often as we come before our King with our our heartfelt repentance, there is a releasing those that have offended us, releasing those that have hurt us. And again, this is important that we understand this is not that we go back and befriend people. This is not that you go and become close contact with those that have hurt you. And it does not mean that what they did was acceptable. What it means is that they need to stand before God and not you. You are simply releasing them. You do not need to do it to their face. You need to do it between you and God. And what forgiveness means is it is a letting go. You're not going to keep bringing it up over and over. You won't believe what she did to me. You won't believe how she hurt me. You won't believe how cruel she was. Forgive them. It doesn't mean what they did was right. It doesn't mean what they did was acceptable. And it doesn't mean that they won't receive due consequence for what they did. But it's not going to come from you. It's going to come from a perfect judge, which we are not. It comes from an almighty, flawless God who knows the perfect uh, position on where to stand. His heart and his judgment is perfect. Ours is flawed. So what we need to do is release that. I'm not going to continue to talk about it. I have forgiven them. They need to stand before God. But I'm not going to bring it up again. If someone forgave you for something that you have done wrong, but they continually brought it up constantly to everybody else and talked about you on how what you did and how it was wrong, then they hadn't truly forgiven you if they're still perpetually bringing up this thing that you did or said that was so what they felt was wrong. If they have forgiven you, they should not bring it up again. And you would expect that. If you've said, I'm so sorry for what I did, please forgive me, then it's over, it's done. We don't continue to rehash and pull out of the grave these things that have been done and said, if you have forgiven the person, then let it go. It's between them and God. God will judge rightly. But remember what he said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. He will have the final say. You forgive them because you yourself need to be forgiven. This is impossible. It's just, we can talk about it. We can, we can try and get this through our heads, but this is why we need to hold on to Romans 8, 26. We need Romans 8, 26 because it tells us that when we find in our prayer life that we have reached an impasse, a place that is just impossible, this is what we do. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is in the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose." You forgive, and God will work things for good for your benefit. But your repentance also needs to be your forgiveness to those that have wronged you. And here we end with the seventh pillar of the Lord's Prayer, verse 13. He says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us 
from evil. The seventh and final is lead us, deliver us. We're asking for God to lead us and deliver us. Lead us not into temptation, simply meaning direct my steps, God. It's important that you and I recognize that God doesn't tempt us. However, God will test us. There's a difference between being tested and being tempted. We are tested through trials in our life. By the way, you are tested both in good seasons and difficult seasons. Good seasons where we are tested. Did we forget about God when, he, when things were working? This is a, a, a test of our character. Did we abandon God because we didn't need him anymore? Or a test through difficult seasons of our life. Did we hold on to God in the midst of it? Or did we curse him because he didn't do what we wanted? God will allow a testing time in your life, but God will not tempt you. James chapter 1 verse 13 says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. So what we're saying is that we are not tempted by God, but God directs our steps. And we're asking him, help us to not be uh, tempted beyond what we can handle. Even Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted. The Spirit of God didn't tempt Jesus, but led him into a season, a testing, where he was tempted. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 says, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. But did you know that they literally called the devil in Matthew 4, verse 3, the tempter. It says, when the tempter came. The devil is temptation. And temptation is not something that you don't want. It's something that you do want. Otherwise, it's not tempting. Nobody tempts you with something that you have no desire for. You are tempted to do something that your natural frame desires and you must crucify your flesh, have self-control and say, I will not do what I know I ought not to do. It's important to recognize, though, that God will not allow a season in your life or a temptation come at you that you cannot endure. He will always provide a way out. If you're in a season right now where you find that you are being tested, your faith is being tested, and you can sense the temptation to wander from God or to get frustrated with God, know that no temptation has overtaken you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. You will not be pushed beyond what you can handle. However, God will test your faith to create endurance within us. This is a good God that does this. It's what we do for our children. However, we have never tempted our children. That is cruel, but we allow a test to come through their life. God is not the tempter, but he does direct our steps. But what we're praying is, lead us, but not into a place where we are tempted to deny you or to forget you. Let me put it this way. 
We often pray that whatever trial we're in goes away. That's that's the common prayer. Father, I'm in a difficult season. Help me through the difficult season. Take it away, God. Remove this trial from me. But imagine if we had the maturity to stop praying that the testing would end, but that the tempting would end. Can you imagine if we prayed for endurance so that we can make it through the trial, not that the trial itself would stop? Look, the trial is producing endurance in you. You don't want that to stop. We need to mature so that we're not just praying, God, stop all bad things and difficult scenarios from happening in my life. But we're praying, God, would you grant me endurance so that I can withstand the the evil one? Think of it this way. When we're training our troops, we, we put them through different tests to crawl in the mud with the barbed wire over their head We do this because there might be a time where they need to, in combat, crawl on their belly through the mud in a dangerous situation. And we want to have trained them enough so that they can survive that difficult situation. However, when we're training these these young men and women how to crawl through the mud, did you know that they also create a way of escape? Come on out. You can come out. But if you come out, you do not pass the test. So there is a tempter that's along the way that says, you can get out of this. All you need to do is quit. We need to stop praying that all trials would stop. We need to start praying that we would have the endurance to not be listening to the tempter telling us to quit or to curse God. We need to pray, God, would you grant me the wisdom to grow from this? Would you grant me the knowledge so that I can see my way through this? Would you grant me the strength so that I can endure it? Which helps you and I understand that he says, lead us not to the temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is where he teaches you and I that we have, we have weapons given to us that we can pray against what the enemy is doing. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12 says, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm. Not to pray, God, take me out of any trial or test that I might be going through. But we're praying, Father, would you give me the the armor that you have provided so that I can stand firm in the difficult day. This is, this is the mature prayer life. All we have thought thus far is, Father, grant us to get us out of this difficult thing. A mature saint of God prays for endurance, not just a way of escape. Not my will be done. Your way is better. So can we mature in our prayer life? Can we begin to involve all seven pieces that we have seen here from our king who taught us that there needs to be privacy in our prayer life? It needs to be authentic and not just rote, repetitious words. That yes, we do have a relationship with the one to whom we pray, but we come with reverence. That he He is our king, but we need to submit to his kingship. Number five, that we pray not just for what we desire, but what we require. Yes, we can offer to God the desire of our heart, but that the desire of our heart is to know him more. To walk in the way that he has set for us. Yes, we are forgiven 
but we need to be those that forgive as well. And lastly, that he would lead us and he would deliver us. Can we, can we become mature saints that pray this way? Father, thank you that you did teach us how to pray. May this outline of prayer that you have given us train us, mature us to be saints that pray accurately, effectively, and biblically. May this sink into our spirit and may we understand what places in our prayer life need maturing. But lastly, Father, we offer to you the very prayer that you just taught us. So not at all by rote repetition, but with all the sincerity we can offer, with all the reverence that we can have, and with all authenticity, would you hear our voice as we together pray to you, our God and our King, we say, you are our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever amen well, god bless you all until we meet again.